If you would be opening your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, we're going to start at the beginning of this chapter today. Good to see everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Good to see Miss Carolyn doing better and able to be back with us today after her knee surgery. Glad that she is improving. David, would you lead us in a word of prayer? Amen. Acts chapter 15. You know, one of the sad realities of the history of the church is there have always been conflicts. There have always been issues that brethren have disagreed on. There have always been times when people have had to sit down and study and discuss things and come to an appropriate, uh, appropriate decision Sometimes we know that they were not able to come to a mutual agreement and sadly divisions have taken place through the years. But what we're going to see as we get into the next couple of chapters here is really the first major conflict that took place in the church. Probably all of you at one time or another, possibly many times through your life, have heard preachers and teachers use the term Judaizing teachers. And essentially what these were, were individuals who had been raised Jewish, were those who come from a Hebrew background. They were ones who had placed their faith in Christ, who had been baptized and become Christians. But they were trying to hold on to certain aspects of the old law. There were things that were ingrained in them, things that they were accustomed to practicing, that they wanted to continue to observe, or at least they believed, based upon misunderstanding or misconception, they believed that these were things that were supposed to continue. So as we come into Acts chapter 15, we find that Paul and Barnabas, they've gone out on this first missionary journey. They've now come back to Antioch. They've given a report to the brethren there of all of the good work that they had done in reaching out to the Gentiles. But now we find that they've been in Antioch for a while. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly how long they stayed. But there were some people that came to Antioch, as we see there in verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and taught the brethren. And so you had some individuals who were Christians who came to the city of Antioch. And notice it says that they came from Judea. Judea would have been the region in and around Jerusalem. This would have been the region that would have received the gospel first. We know the gospel was proclaimed first at Jerusalem and then in the area around Judea. And then as persecution came, that began to spread out into other parts of the known world at that time. Well, some brethren came down to Antioch from Judea and they began to teach the people that unless they were circumcised, that they would not 
be able to be saved. Notice it says that this is according to the custom of Moses. And so these were individuals that had come from a Jewish background. They come from the region of Judea. They've now come down. They are, they are Christians. They have converted to Christ. But they are still holding on to this ideology that we have to continue this custom. This is what we've always done. Therefore, this is what has to be done. This is what is acceptable. Well, we understand from our study of the Old Testament that this sign of circumcision was an indication that you were a part of God's chosen nation. You were a part of that Hebrew people. And so it stands to reason why they would believe that if the Christians are now God's chosen people, then they should continue to go through this practice, continue to observe this custom as an indicator of who they are. And so they were saying, you cannot be saved. You cannot truly be a Christian unless you are circumcised. Well, in verse 2, it says, Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. When I look at this verse, I see several good points that need to be made. First, notice that Paul and Barnabas were not afraid to confront this error. These individuals had come, they were Christians, but they were teaching something that was contrary to the new law. And so Paul and Barnabas, they stepped in, and notice it uses the term dissension or disagreement. They come and they... they discuss these things and reason with these teachers. But as I mentioned earlier, we see that they were never able to come to an agreement just among themselves. And so they determined that the best course of action for them to take would be for Paul and Barnabas and a few of these other individuals to go to Jerusalem. And notice it says who they were to go and visit with. Go and visit with the apostles and the elders. Most people believe that due to the mention here of going to Jerusalem to meet with the elders, many people believe that the church at Antioch at this time possibly did not have an eldership. Or they were in a position to where maybe their elders were tied up in this disagreement. And they didn't know uh, the exact right course to take. But for one reason or another, we find that they decided that the best course is, well, let's go and let's talk to the apostles. These are the ones that we know are inspired. These are the ones that uh, were there with Christ. These are the ones that are going to be the, the best source for us to go to. But also, Jerusalem was the oldest congregation in existence at that time. It was the first congregation to come into existence and more than likely, it would have been the first congregation to have an eldership established. And so this congregation would have been one where these men would have some years of experience in that position. Serving as elders and, and discerning the scriptures and being a, a spiritual guide to the people. I know that there have been times in the years that I've been preaching, I don't know that, that this has happened with, with David and Tom since they've been elders here, but I know that I've, I've heard of times when congregations would not have an eldership and some type of an issue would arise and they would go to the elders of a congregation that they knew was sound to get their advice. Those elders were not exercising authority over that congregation but they were giving wise counsel. And there's nothing wrong with that. If the congregation here at Pyburn Street did not have elders, but one of the sister congregations in the area did, and, a, and an issue arose that I wasn't able to handle, there would be nothing wrong with me going to an older, wiser uh, Christian individual, whether they're a part of this congregation or not, just to get their advice. As I said, it's not saying that Paul and Barnabas and these people from Antioch were going there wanting them to exercise authority over that practice. 
No, they're just going to find out the truth. They want to know what the Scriptures teach. And I know that there have been times as well that that people have reached out to me, um, not because I'm an elder or qualified to be an elder, but maybe congregations that don't have a, a regular preacher. And there would be some type of question that arise, and they would reach out to me and ask my opinion on the matter or things of that nature. We need to understand that just because congregations are autonomous, that does not mean that we only have fellowship and can only be influenced by the brethren in this congregation. We have brothers and sisters in Christ throughout the world that we can be encouraged by, that we can learn from. I know that I'm all the time going on YouTube and other places and listening to sermons or Bible classes or reading articles, things of that nature that have been written by people that I've never met in person. But because I know that they are my brother in Christ, I can be encouraged and instructed by them. That does not mean that they're exercising authority over me. I'm a member of this congregation. David and Tom are the ones that have authority over this congregation. And so the decisions that are made ultimately come down to them. But that does not mean that we cannot seek advice from those outside of this congregation. And that's what's taking place with these members of the church in Antioch. For some reason, they determined that they needed to get the advice, as we would say, of someone older and wiser, someone that's been around, someone that has more experience with dealing with these kind of conflicts. And so they make the determination that they're going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to meet with the apostles and they're going to meet with the elders of the church about this question. Verse 3, so being sent on their way by the church. Now this is another interesting statement. When it says that they were sent on their way by the church, what this means is that the local congregation was paying their way to make this journey. This is not simply saying you're going with my blessing. This is saying we are going to support you so that you can go and take this trip and settle this issue. So they leave and they head to Jerusalem. And notice as they travel along, they go through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. And they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem... They were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So notice what has taken place. They leave Antioch. They're traveling up to Jerusalem. Well, along the way, as was as Paul's custom was, they were preaching in all the little towns along the way. Everywhere they went, they were trying to convert souls. And notice the Gentiles are being very receptive and and a lot of joy is being brought to the brethren in those areas because the church is growing. You know, one of the greatest examples that we can think of is think about the joy that we all experience when we see someone baptized in Christ. Think about the joy that we all experience when someone has gone astray and they come back. But here in the very early days of the church, as the church is growing and maturing, you see all of these people that are coming in being added to the church, people are being converted and added to the church daily. This was an exciting time. But then when they arrive in Jerusalem, notice they receive a warm welcome. The church welcomes them in. They're glad that they're there. The apostles, the elders are encouraged by the report that they bring. But then we find out where the source of this dissension is coming from. It's coming from those who were former Pharisees. What we have to remember, the Pharisees were the most legalistic of the Jewish sects. And that term legalistic 
merely means that they expected everything to be done by the letter of their interpretation of the law. Yes, under the old law, they were expected to live by the letter of the law because if you broke even one of those commands, you had broken them all. But the Pharisees, they were so dogmatic and legalistic in their interpretation of the law. If you did not do things the way that they believed that it was to be done, then there was a break in fellowship. And you saw this in the first century, and especially leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, you saw a great dissension between different groups of Jews. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the Zealots, you had all of these different groups that had splintered off of each other because they all had differing interpretations of the old law. Each one believed that they were correct and they would not extend fellowship to the other groups. So we see that the group that was causing this issue was the Pharisees. They were the ones that were the most radical in their promotion of their belief system. And they believed strongly in a continued observance of the old law. Now, this is something that we're going to talk about in our lesson tonight, so I really don't want to go in depth into it this morning. But something that has always been intriguing to me. You have always had those who wanted to be Christians, who claimed to be Christians, but who wanted to continue to practice certain Judaic practices. You see that with these Pharisees who had converted to Christ. Notice it never once says that they wanted to consider the sacrifices. Notice it never says that they wanted to continue their temple worship and they wanted to continue their observance of all their special holy days and all of those things that were a part of that old law. No, there were only certain things that they wanted to continue. Certain things that you might say were near and dear to them or were ingrained in the culture of the day. Well, we continue to see that in many religious groups today. And we'll talk about that, as I said, more tonight as we look at the next lesson in our uh, denominational doctrine series. But ultimately, the Pharisees, when they hear the things that Paul and Barnabas are preaching, saying that the Gentiles have been saved upon their confession of faith and baptism into Christ, they're saying, oh, hold up. Hold up, that's not enough. Yeah, they may believe in Christ. They may be willing to turn away from their old life and submit to the will of God. They may have submitted to baptism, but they've not been circumcised. And if they've not been circumcised, which is a command, which is expected according to the custom of Moses, then they cannot truly be saved. They can't truly be God's chosen people. So they were trying to retain, as it says here, certain aspects of the law of Moses. They were commanding, notice as verse 5 says there at the last part of that verse, they were commanding these Gentiles, if you're going to come into the church, you're going to do things the way that we say you're going to do them. If you're going to come into the church, you're going to observe our traditions and our customs in the way that we interpret those things. So we see that we're setting up for a showdown here. You have the apostles, you have the elders, you have these individuals who are inspired by the Holy Spirit, who know the truth on this matter. But you have a group of seemingly influential individuals who are trying to lead people down another path. So what is going to take place, beginning in verse 6, is what has commonly come to be referred to in church history as the Jerusalem Conference or the Jerusalem Council. You know, throughout history, you have seen times where brethren would come together to discuss different matters. We've seen issues even in modern times, more modern times, where brethren 
would come together to discuss the scriptural nature of things. And oftentimes those are referred to as, as conferences. They come together to confer with each other on these matters. I know back in the, the 50s and 60s you had a lot of conferences that took place dealing with the subjects of congregational cooperation and support of benevolent organizations, things of that nature. Uh, you go back about 20 more years and you had conferences, people discussing things such as um, Bible classes and the number of cups in the Lord's Supper. You go back into the late 1800s, you had brethren coming together discussing instrumental music and, um, and missionary societies and things of that nature. We see groups coming together today discussing things such as the expansion of the role of women. So you see, these things are still common for brethren who disagree to come together and discuss these matters. Now, one of the things that we've witnessed through history and we continue to witness today, you don't always have as positive of an outcome as we see here in Acts 15. Brethren are not always able to come to an agreement. But what we're going to find is these brethren... They have come together with the purpose. They want to know the truth. They recognize the importance of the ministry that they have been called to be engaged in. They want to make sure that what they're teaching and what people are being led to believe is the Word of God. And so they come together to study this matter. Beginning in verse 6, Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. What do you think he's referring to in that statement? Let me give you a hint, Acts chapter 10. Conversion of Cornelius. We often refer to Cornelius and his household as the first Gentile converts. They were the ones that the Holy Spirit fell upon. So notice what Peter is saying. He says, guys, you know here a while back, paraphrasing, here a while back, you know, God had me go and preach the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time. He had me go and extend the gospel to them, and lo and behold, they received the Holy Spirit. So he's showing them that some of the same things that the Jews had experienced had also already been experienced by the Gentiles. And continuing with this, verse 9, And he made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they? He said God made no distinction when he provided the gospel. Jews and Gentiles are able to come to Christ in the same fashion. He said, but... You believe that you've been set free from, as we talked about a little bit Wednesday night, from this bondage of the old law, but now you're trying to place brethren back under some of that bondage again. You're trying to place a yoke upon their neck that they've been set free from, that God never commanded you to place upon them. And the reasoning, the logic that he's using, he says, if you've been set free from that, why would you want to place that upon somebody else? You see that logic? You know, we can look at it from the standpoint that if you've faced an illness and you've overcome that illness, you wouldn't wish that upon anybody else. And ultimately, that is what Peter is saying. He says, you know, you have overcome this. Christ died so that you could be set free from this bondage of the old law. So why would you wish that upon anybody else? Yes, ma'am.
That's true. And, and, and I believe that it all comes down to this idea of who God's chosen people are. Because the Israelites or the Hebrews, they had always been told, you are God's chosen people from the time of Abraham down through the time of Christ. They were told, you are God's chosen nation. But then what happened when the gospel began to be proclaimed? Who was called God's chosen nation then? Christians. The church. So whenever you think about that aspect, we can kind of understand why they would believe that, why they would teach that. But as Jera said, you know, that's a covenant not that man made with each other, but that's a covenant that God made with man. God is the only one that could change that covenant or fulfill that covenant. But you remember, I believe it was in our lesson last week, we talked about the fact that a covenant can only be taken away in one way. Does anybody remember what that was? What was the only way that a covenant could go away? The person with whom the covenant was made had to die. Well, when Christ died on the cross, all of those faithful Jews, they died to Christ. That covenant was done away with because of that death. But now they are trying to continue something that God had taken away, that God had allowed to run its course. But now they were trying to continue that you know, Josh, I, I get the impression when I study this that, you know, and I think you kind of hinted on this, and I don't necessarily think these Judaizing teachers were trying to make them keep all the law. No. But and and but at the same time, I don't really think this is fully about uh, circumcision. That's the thing that brought it to a head. Right. But it's like you said, they had a lot of pet peeves that they wanted to still carry over from the old law. That's Not right. all of them because they didn't do all of them. And, and I think that's why we have the verbiage there in verse uh, 10 that your fathers nor you could keep it. They could keep circumcision. But he's saying there's more that you're trying to bind than just this because there's some things you can't keep perfect. Right. You can keep perfectly. They couldn't and you can't. Right. Which he's all leading up to Christ eventually. But I, I, I agree with you. It's more than just the circumcision. That's what brought it to a head, and now they're going to deal with all this. Stuff. Right. Well, and once again, not to take away anything from the lesson tonight, but one of the things that you saw in the early church and that has continued even down to today is there have been people who believed that the ritualistic part of the law, the ceremonial part of the law, that was fulfilled, but the moral aspects of the law continued on. And so these were things that, you know, you go back and you read especially the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and you look at just how explicit those moral laws were. The people weren't able to keep it. And like David was saying, you look here at verse 10. Peter's saying, you and your fathers, all of your ancestors, you know, you tried but you couldn't do it. You couldn't keep it. So why go back to that now that you don't have to? But again, and we'll talk about it more in depth tonight, but again, there were some who had developed this mentality that the moral teachings of the law is what was to continue, that you were to continue to observe all of those aspects. And we see this especially, uh, you remember in Matthew 19 when some of the Jews came to Jesus and asked him about divorce. and said, you remember Moses uh, God allowed Moses to give the children of Israel divorces for any reason. What was Jesus' answer? Jesus' answer was, in the beginning, and now it is not so. That was a moral law, though, wasn't it? That was a part of the old law. So if the moral law of the Old Testament continued then why didn't Jesus say, yeah, you know, that's what the law says. That's, that's what you're allowed to do. It's because all of that law 
was going to be fulfilled. The ritualistic part, the ceremonial part, and the moral part. All would be fulfilled and a new and better covenant, as the book of Hebrews discusses in great depth, was going to come into effect. You know, the, the uh, Judaizing teachers kind of, there's a lot of similarities between them and what a lot of the Catholics do today and, and some of the branches off. Catholicism, they want to hold on to a lot of those, not everything from the Old Testament, but a lot of it. That's true. Yeah. yeah. And and once again, I know I sound like a broken record, but once again, that's all things that we'll discuss more, yeah. <laughs> more in depth I tonight. So, your no, lesson. you're fine. You're fine. But... Um, and if you're not able to be here tonight to hear that, you can hear it on YouTube or we can make you a CD if you're interested in that. But like David was saying, yes, we do still see many religious groups today and they may not recognize this, they may not acknowledge this, but they are still clinging on to vestiges of the old law. And they are still going to the old law to justify those things. And so we're going to discuss that tonight of how how we can see that that's not the way that it is or the way that it's supposed to be. We are, we're almost out of time, so let's go ahead and stop right there. I think verse 12 is a good stopping place. And Lord willing, next Sunday morning we'll pick back up there in chapter 15 and verse 12. I appreciate all your comments this morning.